Ok, bienvenido a, a todos y todos. So, soy Paul Gleason, soy el embajador de Irlanda en Chile, Peru y Ecuador. And we're delighted to have you with us today for our series focusing on some really interesting Ireland-Chile research collaborations. We're producing these videos in support of the Irish government Creating Our Future campaign, which is seeking to promote a national and international conversation on research in Ireland and which is looking for ideas in this regard before the end of November. There's more info on how you can get involved at www.creatingourfuture.ie. In today's interview, we're talking about disability law and some exciting Ireland-Chile collaboration that is just getting underway. We're delighted to have genuine experts from both sides of the Atlantic to introduce us to this topic and collaboration. Eleanor Flynn is an established professor at the School of Law at the National University of Ireland in Galway, where she serves as director of the globally renowned Centre for Disability Law and Policy. She has for many years been at the forefront of international research and advocacy on implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And from the west of Ireland to the west of Chile, we're joined also by Pablo Marshall, Professor at the Institute of Public Law at the Universidad de Austral, where he is also directing research on inclusion, rights and citizenship at the Interdisciplinary Research Centre on Inequality and Human Rights. So Eleanor, Pablo, we know how busy you both are and we're very grateful to you for making time for the discussion today. Um, Eleanor, if we can turn to you um, firstly, just for our viewers today, who are coming to this without a background in the area. Can you give us a, a quick sense of what the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is and why everyone who cares about human rights should have an interest in this area? Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm delighted to, to share my ideas and, and work on this topic. So the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is really a, a very good example of the power of people to create international human rights law. It's often referred to as the fastest negotiated UN Human Rights Convention, and it's the one that was negotiated with the highest levels of participation of those directly affected. So disabled people themselves were among the state delegations that created the convention, and they were also very present in civil society organizations. And for the first time, civil society organizations were participating almost on an equal playing field in terms of how seriously their contributions were taken compared to the contributions of states. So for that reason, it's a good example of just what we can do with human rights law. And many of those who negotiated the convention, those disabled activists brought home the lessons from that negotiation and continued to campaign for change to domestic law and policy in their home countries after that process. It really inspired them to continue that campaign for change. And one of the areas in which uh, Pablo and I both work on uh, where there is really exciting change coming as a result of the convention is on the issue of legal capacity. And that means the law's recognition of the individual's right to make decisions in their own life. So all of us value the ability to make choices that the law must respect. We can choose what relationships to have, whether to get married. We choose where and with whom we live. Uh, we choose where we want to work or in what roles we, what we might wish to be, what education we want to pursue for ourselves. And all of these decisions are really important to our identity and what makes us human. And disabled people for a long time have been denied the right to make decisions, including about very basic things like uh, what to eat and when, uh, when to go to bed, who's going to assist you with um, personal care. And without those choices, we're really depriving people of human dignity and we're depriving them of their, their fundamental human rights. So the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is important here because for the first time in international human rights law, we have a really clear statement, not only of people's right to make choices in their own lives, but for their right to access support if they need it to make those choices. And it builds on the recognition we already had in, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which states that women must have an equal legal capacity to men. So the equal ability to enter contracts, own property and so on. 
So we're also now extending that to disabled people. But crucially, what we're adding is that people have the right to access support, which they may need in order to make those decisions. And it's that support that has required really careful thinking, a lot of deliberation and consultation with disabled people's organizations around the world, and a lot of significant law reform to shift our laws away from things like conservatorship or adult guardianship, or in Ireland, we call it the ward of court system, and towards legal recognition of support to make decisions. And that's a really important shift that needs to be made and a challenging one that no country is fully compliant with at present. Very interesting. And I mean, aside from the importance of, of all of this, as you outline it, um, to have achieved the fastest negotiations in US in UN history is quite an achievement, given the UN is famous and remarkable for many things, but the speed of negotiations is not always one of them. So clearly there has been huge progress in this area. Pablo, just hearing that from Eleanor and, and in terms of how you came to these issues, was it around a lot of what was happening internationally there or, or did you approach these issues from a different starting point? Yeah, I have a background on constitutional law, so my, 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 my perspective is, is more from the, from the domestic law. Um, uh, but but I, I mean, it's, it's, there is a necessary link between human rights law and constitutional law nowadays. Um, and, and the trigger uh, of my interest was the, the, the uh, constitutional provision that deprive uh, people with mental disability of their right to vote. So that, that was my, the, the, the element that questioned, uh, well, what is going on on this? Why, why is this uh, happening? Uh, and quickly, um, I realized that the, there, there was a, a bigger problem, right? That was just an, a manifestation of uh, a more uh, sort of um, uh, wider uh, policy and, and legal um, uh, denial of legal capacity in sort of several areas of, law, of, of, of life to people with mental disabilities, uh, and especially to those that have been on the guardianship, as, as Eleanor mentioned. Um, so I, I get into this sort of uh, wider problem, and I started to look at uh, international human rights law, where everything was going on on this topic. Uh, I think in the last probably 10 years, they have, this has been one of the more vibrant discussions in, in international human rights law, uh, with tremendous disagreement between uh, practitioners, uh, academics, and, and that's from an academic perspective is so stimulant. Um, but also, uh, by the time I was um, um, as, as, as this uh, research developed, I was in contact with people with mental, mental disabilities. I was starting, to, I, I, I connect with uh, people from different areas, not just legal academics, um, working with uh, uh, people with disabilities. And I started to sort of embrace sort of uh, a, a, a project of um, uh, social change, uh, social inclusion. And I'm now convinced that not just this need to be sort of analyzed and discussed academically, but it need to be implemented uh, in law. I mean, we need to, especially in Chile, we are in the, in the back of a, of a trend in South America uh, that's, I mean, pretty revolutionarily uh, implementing legal reforms and legal capacity. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm sure, and I'm making every effort I, is in my hands to push for these reforms happening in Chile as well. Very good. And Eleanor, I, I mean, Pablo's talking there about 
collaboration and, and how it very quickly became part of this picture for him. I mean, that was one thing that really resonated for me reading through your hugely impressive uh, CV before this interview. I mean, the extent of your commitment to international collaborations, not just, of course, with Universidad de Austral here in Chile, but, but how disability laws implemented right across the EU, your work with the relevant UN Secretariat on this, as well as the UN Working Group on Aging, and of course your Voices Project, which published the story of people living with disabilities in, I think, 11 different countries across five continents. Um, what is it about international collaboration specifically that is so important for you and for all practitioners in this field? Yeah, I think because we're at the very forefront <clears throat> and the beginning of the journey of reimagining what law could look like in this space, that we need to be talking to others about how they can achieve it. Often within law reform, we get very divided into silos depending on our legal systems. And we say, oh, the civil law systems are so different from the common law, we couldn't possibly, you know, apply that approach in this context. But because we're all trying to change our laws at the same time in this area, it's been really vital to continue those conversations and to talk about what is the legal construct in our system that does match or map across and how might that need to be reconfigured and what possibilities are there? Um, because sometimes there are quite creative possibilities within our legal system that we haven't fully explored um, and listening to other colleagues around the world particularly in Latin America, as Pablo has said, which is really leading the charge on like progressive legal capacity reform. We had hopes for Ireland being one of the first to change our law in this area, but the reforms that have subsequently come between Costa Rica, Peru um, uh, and Colombia have been really taking the next step in this process and really educating all of us as to what is really possible. I would love ha to have had those reforms completed when I started to campaign in this area because you know, legislators are always asking for which country has done this. They want to see that it can be done in order to move forward. And we were saying, just trust us, it is possible. And now we have even more evidence that it is possible from, from the legal reforms that, that have come particularly from Latin America, which have been the most progressive that I have seen anywhere completed successfully and actually enacted as legal changes. So I think we're all on this journey together. So it makes sense where nobody has solved the situation perfectly. So of course we need to um, speak with each other and also involving civil society in that discussion and centering disabled people and their representative organizations has been crucial. And I've learned a lot from other colleagues about the challenges of bringing people with very diverse perspectives together from policymakers to disabled people to families to disability service providers, each of whom have a different approach to the topic and trying to find allies from across each of those areas that agree on the way forward. So I think being able to discuss those more pragmatic strategies with, with colleagues internationally, um, because the challenges we're facing there are universal, even if our approaches within the specific legal systems are quite different, we, we all face the same barriers in terms of integrating these diverse perspectives and reflecting them appropriately in the law that we create. And, and Pablo, turning to you, I mean, explain to me the process by which you notice what's happening in the National University of Ireland in, in Galway, and you say to yourself, there's something interesting happening here. How are the links made then? Are you, does it start just by Googling email addresses or how does it, how does it get going? It's, the, the answer is very simple and very short. Probably, probably Eleanor is the leading scholar on legal capacity uh, in the world, and she has produced so many sort of pieces and books on this that even if we were looking to relate with perhaps state, uh, Ivy League universities in the States or or universities in Europe, well, we, can, we cannot find somebody that have been sort of working on this with that uh, sort of uh, death as, as alien. So it was a, sort of a, a compulsory uh, decision. But also my co-researcher is has um, Irish ancestries. And so he's obsessed with let's do something with Ireland. Uh, and we wanted to go to Ireland to, 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 to experience. I, I, I've been in Ireland, in, in, in Dublin, but I have never been in Galway. So 
So we wanted to go and meet uh, this um, team earlier had been put together. Uh, that's very, I mean, very, very strong. So it's, it's definitely, uh, Galway is definitely one of the sort of leading world uh, wide centers in in disability law, and um, I mean, it was un 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 unavoidable to to try to get them uh, to our network. And, and I mean, hopefully now with travel opening up again and borders opening up, these kind of things become possible in person again. Um, but just sticking, Pablo, just for one minute. I I, I mean, aside from that. This is a fascinating juncture for, for Chile, of course, as well, with the Constitutional Convention at the moment. Yeah. I mean, Eleanor said, you know, from a very objective perspective, Latin America has been out ahead of the posse on a lot of, a lot of this stuff and important aspects here. But, I mean, Chile is, is really involved in a, in a once-in-a-generation effort at the moment around questions around rights and citizenship and so many areas in which you're, you're both expert. Has that for you, Pablo, had an immediate impact on your work and that of your institute and research center? Um, yeah, but I'm not sure if a positive one. <laughs> uh, I mean, the, the, the Constitutional Convention have, have removed uh, so deeply what uh, sort of the, the main topics of the conversation on citizenship rights and the design of sort of fair society uh, should be that i mean it's difficult to focus in anything else that is not the constitutional convention so uh, at certain level uh, everything is a little bit like in the air because we are not we, we cannot sort of plan in advance for example legal reforms if we don't know what's going on in the, for just to give you an example, um, the efforts required for a, um, for a legal reform in legal capacity are consider, considerably different. If we have in the constitution, a provision that guarantee the rights of people with disabilities in, in a way that sort of allows to the convention on um, uh, rights of um, people with disabilities to enter in the conversation, right? For example, a reference to the convention in the constitutional provision, re uh, relative constitutional provision is perfectly feasible right now in, in the way in the debate is being developed, right? Uh, so for that reason, to, to, to think in a, in, in, the, um, in a legal reform outside of the constitution uh, is a certain, it, at certain level, uh, a, 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 a waste of time, but I don't want to say that, I mean, so strongly because of course, uh, um, reforms are at the legal level is going to be required as well. And reforms in the social conception of, of what in, is implied uh, is also going to ha have to take a certain form. But uh, the, the few energies that the movement for people with disabilities has, well, it needs to be focused in, certain, in, 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 in some place. And I think, Nowadays, the place it needs to be uh, the Constitutional Convention, um, because I mean, very um, very good opportunities can be open there, and we cannot allow this opportunity to pass. Absolutely, um, yeah, hundred percent. So it's it's a little bit a, a tricky sort of moment in this in this. Of course, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have one final question for each of you before we finish. The Creating Our Future campaign is aiming to identify, with the help of the public at home and our diaspora around the world, ideas for the future of Irish research. And my question is, if you could give one piece of advice to government policymakers on research in the country where you're working, what would it be? I, Eleanor, we might go to you first on that question if you've a thought on what what is the piece of advice you would give 
to government policymakers on research, one above all others? I would say you have to engage meaningfully with the populations that your policy uh, is directly impacting. And so in our research and the work that Pablo and I are doing, that means engaging with disabled people directly themselves. And for too long in many countries, governments have been more comfortable asking disability industry or families or disability services to tell us what disabled people need. And uh, it's really important that, of course, families will always be part of the conversation and so will services. But when we're asking what is most important to change in our law, in our policy, we have to do that meaningfully with disabled people themselves. When, again, policymakers are comfortable coming to lawyers and researchers and saying, what should we do with this, this legal reform? Tell us what the wording of the legislation should look like. But we have to imagine different solutions. And it's difficult to do that without the direct input of people who have lived through the existing system, can identify the flaws within it, and can imagine better and can tell us what a, a truly just system would look like and how we could design that. So I think any approach that any research, any policy making that purports to be progressive and transformative absolutely has to do that in equal partnership with the community that's affected. And, and, and Pablo, the same question to you, if you could give one piece of advice to research policymakers in Chile, what would it be? Well, wow, this is a this is a tough one. Um, I would uh, I would demand um, sort of more social impact as a as a variable to consider in in sort of in giving the funding. Um, I mean, we have developed a, 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 in the last twenty years a, a, a huge. Um, project on create capabilities in research in, in Chile. But I think now is the time to sort of put those capabilities at the service of sort of uh, society and such a change. So I would, I, I would value um, uh, projects that had a social impact or has a social relationship uh, with certain sort of social initiatives. Uh, and in the way that uh, Eleanor mentioned before, like a dialogue between academia and the different social actors involved in, um, uh, in the management, uh, but also in the sort of questioning in, of the social sort of uh, structures is, is, is a key part of that. But also I would say, we need to look at the, we, we need to keep looking at uh, experiences abroad in, in, and, and, and in disability law in particular, I think we are, are very, very um, um, in the back of a process. Um, we are not very developed uh, and, and, and I think we need to keep looking at what are, have been going on abroad. Uh, and I think, and this is not um, something that this is completely honest. I think Ireland uh, is, a, is a model and it's a place that is very interesting for us in particular, because it's, because it's uh, been taken very seriously, uh, its commitments with human rights uh, obligations. And that's something that I, I I particularly uh, prize, and but on the other hand, it has, it has I think um, a key uh, strategic position uh, in the middle of the European Union. On the one hand, in Europe it has a a a, 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 a side, a European side, but also. Uh, it connects with the Anglo-Saxon and common law tradition, uh, and I think that's very. It's a key. It's a. It's a. It's a, it's a it, that position is very useful for look at uh, sort of examples of uh, policies and legal developments. Absolutely. Well, listen. Thank you both so much for, for your time. I, I'm a a million miles from expertise myself on any of this stuff, but it's clear from even a quick read about what you're doing and the inspiring work 
you're both engaged in that you know it's a hugely important area of law and social policy and something all of us need to give greater attention to especially at times of constitutional change and competing priorities so Eleanor Pablo thank you both very much and from the embassy we wish this collaboration every success in the future thank you thank you